Well, good morning. So, where do I start? Um, Doug had a wonderful lesson prepared for you guys this morning. Um, he, he took a spill yesterday. We were celebrating my wife's birthday. Uh, Amanda's birthday was yesterday. I won't tell you how old she is. If she wants to reveal that, she can. Um, she's still very young, uh, very beautiful. Um, but we were celebrating her birthday. We went ice skating, and, and Doug took a spill, um, shattered his wrist. So they spent all night in urgent care in the emergency room. Um, it's going to require surgery, we believe. So keep him in your prayers. Keep uh, Julie in her, your prayers. Uh, he's in a lot of pain right now. He didn't show it yesterday, but, but you could tell he, he was in a lot of pain. So keep them in your prayers. That being said, this happened last night at about 9 o'clock. I got home at 9.30. They dropped us off before we went to the emergency room. So I've spent all night coming up with a sermon. So, um, be, bear with me. You know, I like to be more prepared than this. Surprisingly, I'm not nervous. That may just be the, the spirit working through me right now. So, God works miracles even today. So, I'm still awake. I'm still here. Um, so, just keep that in, in, your, in your heads as I, as I bring the sermon today. We, make sure this is turned on. <sighs> We are celebrating Memorial Day weekend this week, and half of this slideshow is from Doug, so he, he was prepared, like I said, but he had this, this little comic strip that I'm about to show you that kind of puts things in perspective a little bit, because we, we often, this weekend, forget, which is ironic, because it's, it's a, a holiday of remembrance, and, and we forget exactly what what Memorial Day is all about. Um, and it shows, you know, the family in the car it says we got picnic blankets, cooler, charcoal grill, hot dogs, lemonade, frisbee. Are we forgetting something? As they're driving by a national cemetery. And, and we often, you know, we, we get excited for the three day weekend. We get excited for seeing family and cooking out, but we, we forget exactly what, what we were remembering. And we are remembering our our brothers and sisters, our fathers, our mothers, our family that, that fought for our country, fought for our freedoms, and, and paid the ultimate price for that. So that we could, we could gather here in, in the name of Christ and, and worship Him today. So we, we have these, He has these pictures of these national cemeteries that, that just show countless graves, countless bodies that, that gave up their lives for for our freedoms. And so we, we just, we honor you today. Michael already had you stand once, but so I, I don't want to do that again. There's, surprisingly, there's a large amount of our congregation that is either served or is currently serving. So we are blessed in this congregation and, and we know your, your family worries every time you get sent out. Um, and so we just, we know that we are praying for you always. We are constantly praying for you, um, and we, we just appreciate everything that you guys do for us, you guys and you gals. Um, so this weekend, as we remember those that have fallen, those that have paid the price for our freedom, take time. Reach out to those that you know that are in the service. Reach out to those that you know have lost loved ones, and just let them know that we're thinking about them. Let them know that we're praying for them and that if they ever need anything, you can call any one of us in here right now and we, we will gladly step in there for you. And as important as that is, as important as it is to remember our brothers and our sisters who have paid the price, we gather today and we remember something even more important. And we remember a sacrifice that, that paid the price for everyone that paid the price not only for freedom in this world, but, but life after death. And so this Memorial Day, remember those that have fallen, but remember Christ. Because Christ is at the center of everything. Remember his sacrifice, 
paying the ultimate price so that we might have forgiveness. We might have hope of eternal life. <sighs> that ends Doug's portion of the lesson. The rest of it is all me. Um, but uh, Doug talked last week. He talked about family. We've been talking about this for a while because our families are, are the building blocks of, of our churches. Hey, we, we have healthy families. We're going to have a healthy church. Hey, if we have broken families, we're going to have a broken church. And unfortunately, you know, it seems like you're just looking from the outside that, that Satan is kind of winning this battle in this country. Hey, Satan, as, as Doug mentioned last week, is trying to find new and, and, and different ways to, to attack our families. And he's using some of the old faithfuls that he's used throughout the years. Hey, he's, he hasn't just decided, oh, now I need to start attacking families. He's been doing this for a long time. You look back at the very first family, you know, Adam and Eve, they had two sons, Cain and Abel, and that very first family was broken. You know, Cain killed Abel. That's about as broken as it gets. Two siblings fighting to the death. Well, it wasn't much of a fight, but, but two siblings that, that just have that anger against each other, they're willing to, one of them at least, to, to kill the other one. And so Satan has been attacking our families for a long time. And God, Doug said, you know, we need to be on guard. Hey, he used the, the illustration of, of two fencers or two sword fighters, you know, being on guard. Hey, ready for the attack that's about to come their way because Satan is going to attack us and we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. And I think, I think God shows us what our families are supposed to look like. And I think it's important that we know what a family is supposed to look like. Now, I realize we have families in this room that look different from one another. Okay, he mentioned we have, we have the, the nuclear families, we have the blended families, we have step families, we have single parent families, we have all types of families, and, and not one family looks the same as the other. But but God has given us an idea of how to, to keep those families, the way they look, the way they may be different, how to keep them intact and what his ideal is for each of the members of that family. And so today I kind of want to look at some of the different roles of the family because I think, you know, we, we sang the song, I Stand in Awe of You, and it says, you are beautiful beyond description, talking about God. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? And, and our minds, our, our small little minds, we try to understand who God is. It's not possible. Hey, our, our very mortal bodies can't grasp what it means to be eternal. Hey, our finite minds can't grasp the infinite God. And so God paints a picture for us. God gives us his word and he paints a picture and he uses different symbols, different illustrations to show us, you know, another characteristic of who he is. And he talks about being a rock. He talks about being a strong tower, a fortress, lion, a lamb, king. I've been fighting this microphone all day, so I may be doing it all day while I'm talking. But he gives us these illustrations to help draw a picture for us to understand who he is. And a lot of the symbols that he uses are drawn from the family. Because we all know what a family is. We all have a family. Okay? And so we, we read stories about God the Father. Okay? Christ the Son. And we, we see these different ideals of the family and they point us towards God. Hey, they help draw a better picture of who God is. So I kind of want to look at some of those today. We're going to look at four of them, um, four different roles, how they, how they point us towards God, how those specific members bear the image of God for us. So let's take a look at some of them. First, I want to look at fathers, okay? Fathers, this is the easy one. Hey, we talk about God the Father all the time. 
Um, it's, it's one of our key images in, in talking about the Trinity. You know, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Um, but, but the Father, this is, you know, when I was preparing this lesson, this is one I just kind of said, okay, I got this one. This one's easy. Um, because we talk about God being a father to us all the time. But what, what do our fathers in this world have that point us towards God? Because they share characteristics with God. Um, and, you know, he wouldn't use this description if it didn't apply to him. And so, and I want to say this real quick. I realize, you know, not all of our fathers bear, really point us towards God. Okay, we've, we know some bad fathers, okay? Fathers who beat their children. Fathers who abandon their children. Fathers who just don't show love to their children. And I just, I want to remind us that while I'm talking about these different family members, some of those things you're going to think, I don't see God in my father. I don't see God in my mother. But we're talking about the ideal picture that God has presented to us of these different roles. Okay, we're not talking about the father who, who left as soon as he got his wife pregnant. Okay, that's not the, the way God designed a father. Okay, God designed a father in a specific way, and that's the way that we see God through fathers. So I just wanted to put that out there before I go any further. But fathers bear the image of God. How do they bear the image of God? God provides. Okay, the father is the head of the household as, as God has designed it. He provides for his family. He he works, he slaves away 40, 50, 60 hours a week so that his family has a home. His family has food. His family has security. His family has whatever they need to survive. God works hard to make sure that we have everything we need to survive. God has provided us with everything that we have. In Matthew chapter 7, if you want to turn there with me, I'm just going to read a little bit out of there. Um, <clears throat> if I can find it. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to start in verse 7. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. You know, our fathers know how to give good gifts. Okay, I, you know, my father wasn't perfect, but he did, a, he did a really good job with me, and I am grateful for everything he did. But one thing he knew was, to ha was how to give me good gifts. He knew what I like. Hey, he, he knows I'm a big baseball fan, big Texas Rangers fan, so anytime he could, you know, he'd go out and buy me a new glove or a new bat or a new ball, whatever. And he knows how to good give good gifts to me because he knows me intimately. Hey, my father knew me better than anyone except for maybe one person on this earth, and that would be my mother. Hey, my, they, those two people know me better than anyone here. And they grew up with me, they raised me, they, they taught me everything I know, and they provided for me. My father provided for me, gave me everything I get. And even more so than him, God the Father provides for us. He knows us more intimately than anyone on this earth ever could. He knows us more intimately than we ourselves know ourselves. And God knows how to provide for us. He's going to give us what we need. All we have to be willing to do is to ask for it. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you shall find. God the Father provides. And, and when our fathers on this earth provide, they bear that image of God. When our fathers provide for our children, when, when 
they, they make sure they have everything that they need. They are pointing people towards God. Okay, God designed a father to look like he does. And he uses this image of God as fathers to point us towards him. Not only does God provide, but God protects. Just as a father would protect his family from, from a home invasion or, or whatever else might, might harm his family, a father is going to be there to protect his family. Okay, we, we, I remember growing up in Texas, you know, we, we had that threat of tornadoes. And I remember, I was pretty young, so I don't remember all the details, but I remember it was a big storm, and I just got woke up in the middle of the night, and my dad was saying, you need to go to the basement right now. You need to go, you know, don't grab anything, just go to the basement. Okay, my, got, my dad was looking out for me. And while we were in the basement, you know, he's out there making sure everything's going to go be okay. He's out there making sure, seeing, you know, where the, where the funnel is, where is it going to hit, is it gone, are we safe? He's out there protecting his family because that's what a father does. That is what God does. <clears throat> God protects us. Even though... It may seem like there are times when God is not protecting us. God is with us. God protects us at all times. That doesn't mean bad times aren't going to happen. That doesn't mean we're not going to get sick. Loved ones aren't going to pass away. We're, everything's just going to be you know, hunky-dory for the rest of our lives. That's not the case. Okay, God does protect us, but that's not necessarily, it's not a magical charm. Okay? And it, it reminds me of this, this little comic I saw at one point. Um, Luke 12, before I move on, says, do not worry. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. You know, he talks about Jesus is talking to, to the people, and he says, do not worry. You see the, the birds of the air, how, how God provides for them, how God protects them. God loves you more than the birds. You see the lilies of the field, how beautifully they are adorned? Hey, God is going to make sure you have everything you need. He loves you more than the lilies of the field. So do not worry. God will protect you. Okay, in this little comic strip, it's a little, little small, a little hard to read, but you get the guy there, he's praying. He says, God, please protect me. And then a stone comes and hits him in the head. And he says, why, God, why? And he looks up and he sees... Jesus there, and all the stones that are hitting him, bouncing off of him, and Jesus says, I'm sorry, did one get by me? Are you going to be okay? Hey, and and it's, not a, it's not a perfect analogy, but I think it helps put it into perspective a little bit. These hard times that we go through in this life, it's not because God isn't protecting us. You know, God has, has protected us in the ultimate way by, by sending his son to bear our sins. And even though we may have hard times on this life, we know that the next life, we have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to be concerned about because God has protected us. And he uses this image of a father, God the Father, because we understand that a father, the way God designed it, provides and protects for his children. And that's the way God provides and protects us. Hey, even more so. Okay. So mothers. Moving on. Mothers are a little bit more difficult when we're talking about the image of God because for some reason we have the image of God as being a man. Hey, and it's, it's weird to talk about God as a female. Um, but did, working on this, I, there are scripture where God describes himself like a mother. Okay, especially when, when you look at the, the prophet Isaiah. Okay, a lot of these scriptures come from the prophet Isaiah, and God's talking about nurturing his children, comforting his children, being there for his children. And so our mothers bear the image of God by the way that they love their children. Okay, and Doug is going to talk about this more in depth. It's, it was funny, I was talking to him last night, and the, the lesson I was coming up with for today, you know, he's going to go more in depth. I feel like I've taken a whole series and I'm throwing it out at you at once.
but he's going to break all these down and get deeper into them. So some of the things I don't mention, he's going to mention. Um, but mothers, man, you mothers bear the image of God in so many ways. The givers of life. I mean, that's one thing I didn't talk about, but you guys give life like, like a man cannot. You create human beings. This is only God can. I, I mean, I, I don't know how to, how to say it any, any other way, but, but you mothers create life and you mothers comfort those children that you've born just as God comforts us. Isaiah 66, 13, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. And we think about that ideal mother that God created. The mother that's going to look after her child. And, and when, a, when a father, you know, when one of those stones gets by the father and hurts the child, the mother's there. The mother's there to take up that child in his arms, in her arms, and, and to, to make sure everything's okay. You know, I, I, I picture all the, the mothers, you know, holding their babies, saying, are you going to be Okay. You're going to be all right. And that's God. Mothers, you bear the image of God by the way you comfort your children. You bear the image of God by the way you love your children. There's no love that we know of that is stronger than a mother's love for her babies. Okay, and fathers, I know you are a close second, but a mother's love is, is the greatest love that we know on this earth. And yet that love doesn't even come close to the love that God has for his children. So you think about the mother's love for her baby, that, that first time she sees his or her face, you know, they're just immediately in love. God was in love before we were even conceived. God was in love long after we're, we're gone. God is so deeply in love with us that we just can't fathom it. It's one of those things we, we try to wrap our heads around and we just, we just can't. Isaiah 49, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Even if a mother forgets her child, which she bore, which she raised, which she took care of, she had compassion on. God will not forget you. So we look at God and how he created mothers. Hey, and I realize not all women become mothers. Not all women have that ability. That doesn't make you inferior. That doesn't make you in some way less of a person. You still bear the image of God, but but God gives this picture of a mother, of how a mother is supposed to look, and it points us to him. We all have mothers, and like I said, maybe not all of them were, were good, but the way God designed a mother should point us to him, should show us that compassion that he has, that the way he comforts his children, the way he loves his children. God is not only a parent to us, but God describes himself as a husband. Hey, this one hits a little bit more at home for me because as you guys mostly know, I'm not a parent. So I always feel weird when I'm telling people how to parent their children, how the mother and father are supposed to look when I have no experience in that, that field of you know, work. But but I think I have some wisdom because God has shown us what it looks like. And so I, I don't think I'm stepping too far out of line when I'm, when I'm telling people, you know, this is how a mother and father looks. But this is where I'm more comfortable because I am a husband. Hey, so I know the love that a husband has for his wife. And I, maybe not as much as you guys do because you've been married longer than I have, but, but I've, I've experienced some of this. And so when, when God describes himself as a husband to the church, I understand that. Hey, I understand that God leads his family, just as husbands lead the family. Hey, a husband's job is to make sure that, that his family is safe, just like 
you know, father and husband kind of go hand in hand, so a lot of this is going to sound familiar, but, but the husband leads his family. He makes sure that his wife is, is safe in, you know, following right behind him as he's striving to be towards God. Okay? A husband strives to be towards God, and he pulls the rest of the family behind him, making sure everything in the path is clear, making sure everything's okay. The husband leads just as God leads. God loves his bride, the church, just as a husband loves his bride. Hey, I've been married for just under five years now, and I love Amanda more than anything that that I could imagine until I have kids, I'm sure. But that's a different type of love. And, And God loves his church in the same way, and he describes that in Ephesians. Okay, Paul is talking to the church, and this is our go-to passage when we're talking about families, when we're talking about the roles of the individual members of the family. Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We often, we focus on on the the role of the wives because this is usually why we end up in Ephesians chapter 5 because we want to talk about the role of the wives and, you know, submission and all that fun stuff. But you can't talk about that verse without reading this verse. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I've been going off script too much today. I need to read the rest of that verse. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. <clears throat> Paul describes God's design for marriage here, but he's also describing the relationship between God and his church. The two relationships, they go hand in hand. He designed marriage to look like his relationship with his people and him. Just as a man and a woman will come together in a covenant relationship and become one, God and his people come together and form one. God and his people are inseparable just as a husband and wife are to be inseparable. They come together in that covenant which is unbreakable the way God designed it. Unfortunately, we find ways to break it here on this earth. And, and as you know, Doug read the verse, God hates divorce and it takes two to make sure that doesn't happen You know, God designed it where a man and a woman come together to form one union. And you don't break what God has put together. Okay? Now, I know there are people in this room that have gone through divorce. Okay? And I realize there's pain there. There's there's suffering there. And there was pain and suffering before the divorce. But remember, please remember, I'm talking about the family is the way God designed it. Okay, Satan has attacked our families. Satan has caused divorce rates to go up. But the way God designed it, the union between a husband and a wife is unbreakable. And that's the way he describes his relationship with the church. <clears throat> God the husband loves his wife, us, so much that he gave himself up for her or for us to make us holy. 
cleansing us by the washing with water through the word and present us to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And this is how a husband ought to love their wife. I love my wife, like a lot, but, but my love falls short when I compare it to the love of God for us. We, we can't understand God's love, but he paints this picture of himself and he shows us, he describes himself as a mother, as a father, as a husband, and as a wife. He gives us these images that help us understand who he is better. So how are wives the image bearers of God? This one was a little tougher for me because, you know, there's, there's not just a go-to verse where you can say God described himself as a wife, you know, as he does God, we have God the Father, you know, we have God as a husband to the church, but there's not this verse where it says God is the wife of his people. But I, you know, all, it, all I have to do is look at my wife and I see God. God is a helper. Okay, just as the husband leads the family, the, the leader needs a helper. We look at Genesis chapter 1. Adam needed somebody. Adam couldn't do it on his own. And, so, and God saw this. God saw there was no one fit to help Adam. And so in Genesis 1, so God created... Oh, first, before I, I told you I'm going off script. And, and I, I missed an important part, but wives also bear the image of God. We often struggle when discussing the role of wives in the family during church. But I want to be clear that both husbands and wives bear the image of God. Genesis 1.27 reads, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are all created in the image of God. We have different roles. Hey, just as, you know, we talk about the Trinity, we talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They're all the same, they're all equal, and yet they have different roles. Hey, we are equal, male and female, we are equal. We just, we're different. Hey, it doesn't take long to realize that a man is different from a woman. And, and we, we have different roles. And so God has created a helper for the man. Genesis 2.18 says, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Did you know that God is a helper? John 14 verse 16 says, And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Who is equal to God the Father and God the Son, but has a different role. It's funny, I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit on my class on Sundays because I feel like it's, it's one of those, that, that part of the Trinity, the Trinity that gets left out. We talk about God the Father and Jesus Christ all day long, but when we get to the Spirit, we, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. Does, is He here with us? Is He inside us? Is does he make us do things? Is he just, is he a conscience? We don't know what to do with the Spirit. And so when we talk about the Spirit, we, we, we fumble about and we don't realize that he has an important role just, just as much as God the Father and God the Son. And Jesus says, you know, I'm sending one whom will be your helper and through him you will do greater things than even I did. Time out, we're going to do greater things than Jesus did? That's what he says. Do you believe what Jesus says? Then, yeah. We're going to do greater things than Jesus with the help of the Spirit. Husbands need the help of their wives. I wanted to read this, this little section I found. <clears throat> found this online. I thought it was very very important that I read this. It says, when you read women are to be helpers, please don't fall prey to the notion that this means women are to be subjugated. 
The subjugation of women is an affront to God. Rather, please see it for what it truly is, that women are to embrace their role that is modeled by the Holy Spirit, who is called the helper. By being a helper, women follow the guidance of their husbands as they follow Christ with respect and kindness. They are to use their gifts and abilities that God has given them for, their, for his glory and their joy. This includes serving to bring conviction of sin upon their husbands, not with mean spirit condemning words, but with words that build up and encourage. I spent a lot of time reading the section in 1 Peter. Hey, and 1 Peter says you know, a lot of the same things that this, this little paragraph said. Let me, let me get to 1 Peter real quick. And he, he's talking about, this is another one of those sections where it's talking about the roles of, of different people in society. He talks about the roles of all people that we submit to authorities. And he talks about slaves and masters. And then here, he talks about Jesus in the middle of this section. And I think it's interesting. Starting in verse 21 of the second chapter of 1 Peter. He says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. <coughs> Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. So that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. I love that section. And unfortunately, the way our Bibles are, are constructed, the way we have the chapters and the verses, we, we skip ahead to, to chapter 3 without reading the previous verses right before it. We start in chapter 3, verse 1, where it starts talking about wives. And we don't look at the, the section right before it where it's talking about Jesus submitting to the authorities of his time, suffering for, for his church. And, and we miss this brilliant picture of God in the description of the wives. Because the wives are, are there to help. The wives are there to submit, which is not to mean they are subject. Okay? They aren't in, in slavery to their husbands. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about submission. The way God designed it, a wife is glad to submit to her husband. Because her husband is willing to sacrifice himself for her benefit. Okay? And, and we miss this beautiful picture of of a woman who is strong in her own, in her own mind, her own self, who by the way she lives draws her husband closer to Christ, who doesn't need fine jewelry or nice makeup or nice clothes because her inner self is so beautiful that when people see her, they are drawn closer to God. We miss this picture of God when we, we read these sections about wives. And so we look at these different roles of the family. We look at the fathers, the mothers, the husbands, the wives, and we, we are drawn closer to God because they all bear images of God. Okay, God uses these ideas that we know so well. We have a mother, we have a father a real life physical one that we can touch and, and feel. And we, a lot of us have husbands, a lot of us have wives that we can understand what that love is. And so God paints this picture for us. And so I just wanted to point out just this, this little thing. Family, the way God designed it, will help give us a clearer picture of who God is. 
and a clearer picture of who God is will help us raise families the way God designed it. Hey, family will give us a clearer picture of God and a clearer picture of God will help our families because it shows us how we are supposed to love each member of our family the way God loves us. We have an opportunity now. We do every day, but specifically today we have this opportunity to, to come and, and ask forgiveness, to confess sins, to get things off of your chest that, that you've been holding in. So we have, if you just need some prayer, we have our elders in the back um, who are always willing to talk to you. If you don't want to talk to them today, give them a call throughout the week. They'll be glad to talk to you. Or you can come up front. If you're ready to give your life to Christ, please, we ask you to come up front now. We've got a baptistry right over here. I think the water's warm. It should be warm every Sunday. If it's not, it still does the job. But we, we are always ready to, to help you give your life over to Christ. Maybe you just need to talk to your spouse. Maybe you need to look over to the person sitting next to you and say, you know what? I failed. I haven't been the father that I need to be. I haven't been the mother I need to be or the husband or the wife. And I'm sorry I haven't pointed you towards God. So whatever you need, if you need an elder, if you want to be baptized, if you want to talk to your wife, we, we have this opportunity now as we stand up and as we sing this next song. <laughs>